Welcome to the webinar, Unleashing the Positive Power of Compassion, Science, Skills, and Strategies for Health and Well-Being. Hi, I'm Barbara Lewis, the Managing Editor for .com. We're honored to have with us today an expert in this field. Dr. Beth Lown is the Medical Director for the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare and Associate Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Mount Auburn Hospital. Welcome, Beth. Thank you. The webinar will last 30 minutes. The recording and the PowerPoint will be available on the .com website very shortly. If you have any questions, you can type them into the question box located in the panel. And if we don't have a chance to get to your question during the webinar, we'll respond afterwards. So let's get started. We've got a lot to cover. Beth? Well, thank you very, very much, Barbara, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm so happy to be speaking with you today about unleashing the positive power of compassion. During this webinar, I will focus on compassion in practice and explain why this is important and why, especially now, it's important. I'll talk about just a little bit of some of the really exciting emerging social neuroscience research on empathy and compassion a theoretical model of clinical compassion and a framework of supporting skills that I hope you will take and use and also then we'll conclude by reflecting on some of the systemic challenges and supports that we're all going to need in order to provide truly compassionate care. But I would like to start by telling a true story. The emergency room team was ready to receive a nine-year-old girl who had collapsed on a nearby school athletic field, but they were unable to resuscitate her. The ER physician, who had herself just returned to work from maternity leave, gazed at this child's lifeless body with disbelief. When the child's mother arrived, her wails gripped everyone who could hear them. The charge nurse supported the mom as she led her into a conference room where they were met by the social worker and chaplain. Patients in the waiting room responding to the receptionist who was apologizing for the delay said, please, take care of that family first. We can wait. A member of the code team tried to comfort the ER physician before she turned to the next patient and the next patient as we all do. But in that moment, everyone, including those in the waiting room, became members of a caring community. Why did that happen? It is because compassion is a universal response to suffering. We are hardwired to experience compassion and to offer help. But the cultures, the organizations, the systems we inhabit can dampen and sometimes extinguish our compassion. And that is what I want to talk about today. So how are we doing in this country when it comes to providing compassionate care? The Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare conducted a national survey on the state of compassionate care in this country a couple of years ago. We hired a firm to do random digit dialing of over 10,000 cell phones, landlines, to access a nationally representative sample of 800 recently hospitalized patients and 510 physicians. And we asked them, does the US healthcare system provide compassionate care? Nearly half of the patients and 42% of the physicians said no to this question. And then we asked, do most healthcare professionals provide compassionate care? And just think for a moment how you might respond to this question. Well, in our study, again, not quite half, 46% of the patients said no to this question, but only 22% of physicians. So clearly we have a disconnect between what physicians feel they are providing and what patients believe they are receiving. So what exactly is compassionate collaborative care? And I will show you our definition, a brief version of it. It is working interdependently to recognize and ameliorate others' concerns, distress, pain, and suffering. And there are a couple of key points I want to make. First of all, compassion is not something we say for end-of-life care. It is offered whenever another person is in distress, whatever the circumstances. And that can only be defined by the person who is experiencing that sense of distress. 
And second is that compassion and collaboration really has to be embodied at all levels of relationships. I think of it as an ocean. It flows not just towards patients and families, but it, it flows amongst all of these levels of relationship. Compassion with self, with patients, families, with coworkers, staff, with our leadership, administration, managers, supervisor. It has to exist at all levels of relationship. I'm often asked what distinguishes compassion from empathy and sympathy, and I like this cartoon from a text by Mohammad Reza Hojad, an empathy researcher at Jefferson, and he describes empathy really as a cognitive process. It's about feelings as, as if you were another person, as if you were walking in that person's shoes, where sympathy is really more about feeling sorry for another person, and then compassion lives right in that sweet spot between empathy and sympathy, cognition and emotion, and it is about feeling with another person, walking alongside, not in his or her shoes, and I'll explain why that's important in a moment. And it is associated with action, which is not always the case for empathy. So here's our theoretical model that I've been working on, and this is really based on research from the social neurosciences, cognitive psychology, social psychology, this emerging neuroscience and social neuroscience of empathy and compassion, and of course the communication skills uh, research literature. I've drawn it linearly, but you just have to know that this is a really iterative and organic process so that every component affects every other component in this model. And we're not going to have time to go through all of these different elements, so I'm going to just touch upon some that I think may be a little bit less well known or understood. From this model has emerged this framework of observable behaviors and some also some values. And you can access a complete description of this framework on our website. We've written uh, very extensive behavioral descriptors for those of us who teach and who like to try to see if we can actually assess some of these skills. So please do feel free to access this. Uh, this whole process really has to start with focusing our attention. The whole process of compassion is based on being able to do this. We can't really experience compassion if we don't notice that someone else is in distress. And you know, and I know, that this is increasingly difficult these days with electronic health records and handheld devices and alerts and alarms and all kinds of things that distract our eye gaze and our sense of focus. So I've started to practice something I call a doorknob strategy, just many moments of mindfulness before I walk through into a patient's room, whether it's in a hospital or an exam room, or even into an interaction with a colleague or a staff member, I will really consciously and in a disciplined ways try to set aside all the noise, all the chatter, the to-do list inside my head so that when I walk through that threshold, I really can fully receive the person on the other side of that door. We also, in order to experience compassion, have to really deepen our skills for recognizing emotions. And of course that involves active listening, but it also involves accurate interpretation of facial expressions of emotion and also nonverbal behavior. And this is something I think we don't really pay enough attention to, nor do we teach. But a colleague, a friend, Helen Reese, psychiatrist at Mass General has done some interesting work in this regard. This is from a randomized trial she did with uh, folks at Mass General Hospital Physicians. And she taught them some of the neuroscience of empathy. She taught them how to accurately decode facial expressions of emotion based on a protocol of Paul Ekman. And she had the intervention and the control group residents' patients in their ambulatory clinics actually rate their empathy using an instrument called the CARE instrument. And you can see that not only did they perform better on these skills that she had taught them, but that their patients of the intervention house staff really rated their empathy at significantly higher levels. So clearly these skills can be taught and they are associated with important outcomes, outcomes that are important to patients, our sense and their sense, their perceptions of our empathy. So when we are observing another person in pain or whether we're in pain ourselves, experiencing pain ourselves, the neural networks in our brain 
that are associated with this sensation start to get activated. So when we are watching another person in pain, we start to activate networks in anterior insula and also in um, the cingulate cortex, parts of the frontal gyrus. This is an involuntary bottom-up phenomenon. We don't control it. Uh, it's called experience sharing by some, affective empathy by others, and then within milliseconds or maybe co-activated in real life, the parts of the brain that start processing what our senses are really bringing to our awareness start to kick in. And some people call this mentalizing or cognitive empathy, uh, learning to take the perspective of another individual. And these processes are really strongly mediated by a whole host of variables, some of which are listed here. First, there's trait empathy. We're not all hardwired to experience empathy in the same way. Repetitive exposure to observing others in pain has been shown to actually downregulate these neural networks that constitute the empathy for pain uh, centers. And this has been shown in physicians and also in acupuncturists. Perspective taking mediates this process. Whose perspective we take? our capacity for emotion regulation, and also, of course, the culture, the context within which we are observing another person's distress. So let's focus for a second on perspective taking. And this study by Liam, Batson, and Desetti, participants were asked to watch video clips of people experiencing a painful auditory stimulus. And before each video, they were given a set of instructions. The first was to imagine themselves in this painful situation, which you might just do for yourselves just for a moment. Just imagine how you might feel experiencing this painful auditory stimulus. And then switch gears and just imagine what that other person might be experiencing. Have you got that in your minds? In this experiment, the imagined self-instructions led to pretty extensive personal distress. Imagine that person's experience, that other's experience, led to empathic concern, which is another term for compassion. So it may be that if you are practicing empathy only by imagining yourself in another person's shoes, it may be time to switch out those shoes and imagine things based on another person's actual experience rather than what it might feel like to you. And that, of course, requires actively listening and eliciting what matters for that person. So there are at least two potential outcomes of empathy. There's empathic concern or compassion, which is a family of other focused emotions like tenderness, caring, concern, love. And this has been associated with good health and also approach and pro-social motivation. And then there's personal distress, which is really a self-focused, aversive emotional state associated with negative emotions, poor health, withdrawal, non-social behavior, and ultimately to burnout. So there are two pathways to sort of sustaining our sense of being able to be other-centered, patient-centered, family-centered, relationship-centered, and to sustaining our own sense of well-being. We can either focus on increasing compassion or we can decrease personal distress. So let me talk a little bit about decreasing personal distress. And I'm going to talk just for a minute about emotion regulation and two different approaches to emotion regulation. And I'm going to start with cognitive reappraisal. I'll just tell you a brief story, a clinical story, to help illustrate this. Some time ago, I was caring for a very lovely young woman who suffered from a very severe eating disorder. Um, who took just numerous laxatives and then uh, was taking uh, electrolyte replacements under my supervision. I would see very, very frequently very difficult situation and very painful to watch, uh, not to mention for her to experience and to be suffering from. But over time she met and she became engaged with a very kind man, a loving, a loving man who uh, uh, really cared for her welfare. And the patient started to work with a therapist to cut back on her laxatives and to really try to address some of the underlying conditions that had resulted in this, in this problem for her. And one day I was seeing patients and I got a call from a nearby emergency room um, to tell me that this patient had actually been brought in. She, she had arrested and they couldn't resuscitate her, likely from an electrolyte imbalance. And of course, my heart just sank. I mean, what can, what can you say after something like that? All I could think of is what had I missed. I reviewed her labs. Did I miss something? Had I hospitalized her? And then 
I received a phone call from her fiance, and I took a deep breath. I feared what he might say, but instead of questioning or blaming, he thanked me for my long relationship and steadfast support of his beloved. He had understood very well how ill she was, but he had dared to hope that they might share a life together. And he understood, he said, that no one, neither he nor I, could have controlled the outcome of this potentially lethal illness. And from that surprising source of support, I was able to begin to let go of my self-recrimination. That's cognitive reappraisal. It's about attaching new meaning to our experience. It is primarily self-focused with the aim of decreasing our own negative emotions. And it can be helpful and it can be difficult without help. Another approach to emotion regulation is through secular meditation training, which some people call brain training, which seems to reset internal responsivity to emotional distress and increase affect tolerance. So let me show you some really exciting stuff that's going on. This is slide is from work by Tanya Singer and Olga Klemecki at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, Germany. They're doing some very interesting research, uh, and this was from a, a randomized trial that they led. They wanted to compare affect training with a, uh, an active control, in this case memory training. And so they took uh, a group of uh, intervention uh, uh, research subjects and subjected them to one day empathy training. For the empathy training, first they were asked to visualize their own past suffering and then to resonate with another suffering, beginning first with a loved one, then a neutral person, a challenging person, and so on, uh, eventually thinking of how to extend that to the suffering of all sentient beings. And then they did pre-post measurements, fMRI scans, and then they had the same group go through a compassion training, a one-day training in which they were again asked to first visualize their own past suffering, but then to, cult to cultivate feelings of loving kindness, care, concern, first towards oneself, then a loved one, a neutral person, and so on. What did they see? Well, the subjects did report increased self-reported empathy, but they also reported a marked increase in negative emotions. And they tested this in response to some standardized video scenes that they had created. And these are scenes of people both suffering in painful situations, but also just everyday scenes of everyday life. And again, they saw this activation in insula and anterior medial cingulate cortex, that empathy for pain neural network. After the compassion training, negative emotions returned to baseline, and they the subjects had increased positive emotions in response to these standardized videos. And the activations were in different locations in the brain, medial orbital frontal cortex, pregenual anterior cingulate cortex, and striatum. One more interesting study by Jensen and colleagues. It's the only study I know in which physicians were actually placed inside fMRI scanners. They were subjected to painful thermal stimuli. And then they placed an experimental subject in front of the physicians who were inside the scanners and said, OK, we're going to do the same thing to this subject. Here's a button. You'll press it. We'll let you know if you completely or incompletely relieve this patient's pain. Of course, the physicians were more satisfied when they thought they were completely relieving the patient's pain. But again, the interesting thing is the parts of the brain that light up when physicians and other healthcare professionals believe they are relieving the pain, the suffering of another human being, are those parts of the brain that have been classically associated with dopamine-related reward processing. These are the centers that are associated with affiliation, a sense of reward. Brief summary. In terms of emotion regulation, cognitive reappraisal primarily decreases negative affect. Compassion cultivation increases positive active uh, affect and pro-social motivation to help, and there are distinct neural networks involved when these uh, different things are cultivated. So why is this important? Compassion is considered a positive emotion. Positive emotions build resiliency. And this is from uh, Barbara Friedrichsen's model, uh, the broaden and build theoretical uh, model. And her research has shown that positive emotions increase our ability to find meaning in adversity. 
which helps us build coping skills, which in turn builds our resiliency. And this creates an upward spiral of positive emotions. This is important because our capacity to experience and offer compassion is not only good for patients and families and perhaps to colleagues, but it actually may protect us from burnout. There are numerous communication skills that are absolutely foundational to this model, and I'm not going to go into all of these. But I will just mention briefly that a critical piece, it's an essential piece in experiencing compassion, is that we actually have to value the welfare of the person who is suffering. We have to care about that person. Without that, compassion just doesn't happen. And this critical step is mediated by assumptions, stereotypes, bias, which is another aspect of our education in this model that I think we need to develop further, enhance, so that these assumptions can be brought to conscious awareness and discussed and reflected upon. So here's our model. At the center of it is our well-being. We can't experience compassion, let alone offer it to anyone else if we ourselves are depleted. And you and I know that we are at risk. There is really a significant proportion of healthcare professionals that are experiencing burnout. And this proportion has increased significantly over only a couple of years. Our work-life balance satisfaction is declining. And we have known for a while now that the rate of physician suicide is significantly greater than that of the general population. What is it that's leading to all this burnout, that's inhibiting our well-being and compassion? Again, I think you know all of these, these elements that are really uh, difficult for us to, to deal with, to manage. Workload, staffing that may not be sufficient for the complexity of patients that we see. There's discontinuity, fragmentation of care. Our values may not concur with those of our organizations. I think especially for physicians, there's a loss of sense of autonomy and control. For primary care docs in particular, who may be in smaller groups and not necessarily going into the hospital to admit patients anymore, I think there's a real sense of isolation and loss of community. And of course, there's burgeoning documentation, regulatory requirements, and the ubiquitous time pressure. So we clearly need systemic approaches to culture change in order to really be able to enhance our compassion and to offer it to others. So a few years ago, the Schwartz Center for Compassionate Healthcare convened a group of people who included patients, families, uh, patient advocates, clinicians across all different healthcare professions, educators, researchers, and policy people. And we asked them, help us envision a truly compassionate healthcare system or a healthcare organization. What does it look like? And what do we need to do in order to get there? And this group with us articulated seven key strategies that we now call our guiding commitments. And again, you can access this on our website. But they include a commitment to compassionate leadership to valuing and rewarding compassionate care, education, supporting caregivers, those of us who provide the care in order to enable compassion and wellness, prioritizing this in quality improvement, involving learning from patients and families, and doing some meaningful research and measurement of what matters to patients and to healthcare professionals and other staff. So I'm going to show you one case example that was published very recently by Vivian Lee and colleagues in academic medicine. This is from the University of Utah uh, Health System. And they were doing uh, poorly, actually, in terms of their patient experience scores, their quality measures, employee satisfaction. And so they embarked on a large culture change initiative that they wanted to be based on their core values. So they began with a leadership retreat to really articulate what is it that we are all about? What is truly important to us? And they articulated these values. They uh, actually uh, created new leadership roles. And they began on a very gradual project of sharing patient experience data across the organization associated with some coaching and mentoring. They embarked on something called values-based employment, which I'll show you in a minute. They let each unit define their own action plans that were based on these core values. They engaged their students, their trainees. They celebrated successes, large and small. But let me show you this values-based employment. So for each one of their core values, 
they created an interview guide and they trained people to use this interview guide when uh, working with people who are potential employees during the recruitment processes. They also started using this for promotion and retention purposes. So take a look at this. You know, when they articulated their core values, compassion and collaboration bubbled up to the top. So here's an example of these questions. Give me an example of a time when you were particularly perceptive regarding a patient's feelings and needs. What did you do? What was the impact for you, for the patient? This is a really interesting approach to recruitment, to employment. Uh, that really helps to reinforce and sustain a culture of compassion and collaboration. So what happened with all of this? Well, their patient experience scores went up. They had improved employee satisfaction, lower rates of malpractice, improved their quality and safety measures, and they had decreased costs. So they were actually able to approach this quadruple aim that we talked about, improving patients' pers perspectives and experiences of care, improving health, lowering costs, and sustaining the well-being of the workforce, the quadruple A. So let's talk a little bit about the importance of supporting caregivers and all of that. That's all of us, everybody who touches the care of a patient. And I want to talk about Schwartz Rounds, for those of you who aren't familiar with it. So this is an international program that began in 1997. These are multidisciplinary forms for anyone who touches the care of a patient in a given healthcare organization or facility whether that be inpatient, outpatient, in a nursing home, can come together and talk about some of the really challenging psychosocial, emotional aspects of taking care of patients, the impact of illness on patients, on families, and on us. And these have spread quite organically all over the world. If you're interested in learning more about this, please go onto our website. We have studied the impact of this. We know that they increase attention to psychosocial elements of care they improve attendees' perceptions of teamwork and communication amongst members of the team. And it seems that these rounds also decrease stress in the sense of isolation. So is this important? Well, I'll show you that as we are shown care, so shall we show care to others. This is work by Laura McClellan and Tim Vogus. This is something they call the Compassion Practices Scale. It's a measure of organizational compassion. And they recruited a sample of CEOs and COOs across uh, the states and asked them, to what extent does your hospital use recognition programs for employees' acts of caring towards patients and families, towards each other, compassionate caregiver awards, regular counseling, and support sessions, much like the Schwartz Rounds. And what they showed was that in all regression, these practices remain positively and significantly associated with patients' ratings of their care and likelihood to recommend the hospital. So clearly, support for caregivers, all of us who provide care every day, has an impact on patients' perceptions of the care they receive. So we need to take care of ourselves. We need to take care of others. And we need to think about how to prevent and address burnout. I was really heartened by a recent systematic review and meta-analysis by Colin West from Mayo Clinic that appeared recently in The Lancet. He did an excellent meta-analysis of interventions to address burnout amongst physicians. And what he showed was that a variety of interventions were effective. He looked at both individually focused interventions, mindfulness meditation, positive psychology strategies and the like, and they looked at organizational structure changes. And what was interesting was that they were both effective. So this really improved my sense of optimism that we don't have to wait for the system to change to really think about initiating other kinds of interventions that might help us prevent or address burnout. We can work on multiple fronts simultaneously. I think that all of us are feeling overmeasured and underappreciated, but if we're going to measure something, let's measure compassion. So we've created the Schwartz Center Compassion Care Scale, and we have tested it in a variety of different populations in this country, among recently hospitalized patients amongst ambulatory patients with multiple chronic complex conditions. It was also tested recently in Ireland. And I would love for you to test the scale and to use it as a, uh, a test of change. And I'd be happy to talk with you about that. Just give me a call or email me. 
So let's just sum up where we've been. We've been talking about this model for compassionate collaborative care with all of its various elements, with our own well-being at the heart of this, uh, enabling us to sustain compassion, which is a family of positive emotions, which sustains not only patients and families, but ourselves. And the fact that this approach, this stance, this orientation, this way of being in the world really has to exist at all levels of relationship. Compassion is good medicine. It heals those who are distressed or suffering. Compassion nurtures our well-being and the well-being of those we serve. Compassion creates a shared sense of meaning, and it reminds us of our common humanity. So I leave you with the words of the Dalai Lama. Love and compassion are necessities, not luxuries. Without them, humanity cannot survive. I invite you to email me, to give me a call. We are going to host a, a conference in Boston in June 2017, which is going to focus on creating cultures of compassion and organizational culture change. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for listening. Beth, thank you so much for that. That was just terrific. And thank you for sharing your stories and this extremely important information. And thank you to everyone for attending this webinar. The recording and the PowerPoint will be on our website shortly. If you have any questions, please contact Beth or me. And if you're interested in a free one-month subscription, you can contact me or simply insert the code in our subscription area on the website. Thank you very much.